Hi folks, welcome to another Intermediate Bird ID session. I'm Kyle Drake with Birds Canada here in Saskatchewan. This video is made in part to support participation in the Saskatchewan Breeding Bird Atlas, a citizen science project that aims to determine the contemporary status and distribution of birds that nest throughout the province. Here we have another grouping of species that will frequently use wetlands during the breeding, se uh, during the breeding season. So our grouping today is going to cover shorebirds, rails, herons, bitterns, and cranes. I want to remind you that this will not be all shorebirds that could occur in the province because some of them are boreal or arctic breeding species that will pass through during migration, which can overlap with the breeding season of our resident shorebirds. But since we are focusing on breeding species, this narrows the list down a little bit. So let's get started. We're going to get started on the, the bigger species here, the, the herons, bitterns, and cranes. These are all uh, tall, large birds, uh, long legs, long necks, really long, sharp pointed bills for uh, pecking at things or spearing things, and the sexes uh, look similar. So if we start off with the great blue heron, this is a, a really large bird. Uh, it, it builds stick nests in trees and nests colonially. It has a large pointed web shape, wedge shaped bill, long slender neck and, and long legs. It's this bluish gray coloring overall and has a black bold eye stripe that extends into a plume behind the head. When these birds are in flight, their neck is tucked. And um, you'll see them in a variety of habitats, often foraging near wetland edges. And these things are uh, great hunters and, and will take pretty much anything from fish to frogs to small rodents and arthropods. They eat lots of things. All right, the American bittern is uh, one of our, what we call our secretive marsh birds. It's a large heron-like bird, has a compact body and a thick neck and relatively short legs. Again, it's got this sharp pointed bill. And this is one of those species that's more often heard than seen with its pumper lunk calling. It's got really cryptic coloration as you can tell by this streaking that allows it to stand among reeds and cattails and basically disappear. And these birds like large wetlands and, and large complexes of, of habitat, but they will often breed in the upland in the grass. And we're going to listen to this bird because like I said, it's one of the species that you'll more often hear than see. So that's a pretty deep call and it actually travels um, for a long ways. These guys, you can hear them from calling from quite a long ways away. All right, the Sandhill Crane. So during migration in Saskatchewan, you're likely to see th three subspecies of Sandhill Cranes that get um, you know, smaller than the ones that nest here. As you go further north, the subspecies that nest uh, further and further north are smaller birds. But here we have a quite a, the largest of the, the subspecies. This bird has a large pointed web shape, wedge shaped bill, uh, long neck, long legs, blue gray body feathers that can vary in this rusty staining that you see on this bird that's that's pretty well stained. They have a bright bare patch of red skin that covers the forehead and part of the crown. And when these guys are flying, their necks are extended. So these birds will nest uh, near large isolated wetlands and in open areas of the boreal forest, but we'll often see them, um, especially during the fall uh, in the prairies, 
up in the upland habitats, foraging and agricultural fields and pastures. So next we're gonna cover uh, the rails, which includes the American coot. These are small chicken-like marsh birds with short upturned tails. They often prefer to walk or swim than, than fly away. Um, you'll see coots um, often sitting out in the middle of wetlands on water. But all the rails, the Sora, Virginia rail, and, and yellow rail are, are quite secretive. Often will stay in uh, dense emergent vegetation. And these are birds that you very infrequently get looks at. But we have some great photographs to talk about what those birds look like when you do get to see them. And we will also cover the sounds of these birds because these species, especially the bottom three there, are more often heard than seen. Like 99.9% .9 of the time you detect one of these birds, it's going to be heard more so than seen. American coot, uh, you know, believe it or not, the coot is, is, is a rail but it's more duck-like in its habits. Um, it's the largest of, of the rail species that we get here in the prairies. It's a pretty much just a black bird with uh, some white tail feathers, and it's got this really bright white pointed bill and a striking red eye. These birds are one of the more common uh, species that you will see uh, on wetlands in addition to the variety of duck species that we get here in the province, but uh, not uncommon to see these guys feeding their kids out in the middle of the wetlands uh, in June and in July after the birds have hatched their nests. All right, the Sora. This is one of my personal favorite birds. It's a small rail. It's one of the most common uh, wetland birds in Prairie Canada, um, probably the most common marsh bird outside of the collective ducks. Um, it's a small rail with a striking yellow bill and this mottled plumage, but um, a black mask and throat. This is a very vocal species. Um, if you spent any time around wetlands of almost any type, you've probably heard this bird. It's got a couple of different calls. We're going to listen to the whinny, which is its territorial call um, or its pair bonding uh, call. And, and then we'll listen to the per weep, which is more a contact call. So that's the whinny call. And that is known as the per weep. So those are calls that if you spent any time near wetlands in Prairie Canada and the crepuscular periods, you've likely heard this bird already. Okay, so the Virginia rail is a medium-sized rail. It's actually slightly larger than the Sora, but you'd only know this if you had the birds in hand and were actually making measurements. My experience with these two species is that Sora are dominant to Virginia rails. I've seen them displace Virginia rails on a couple of occasions. Um, but that said, Virginia rails are likely in more places in Prairie Canada than people realize, but it's just a really secretive bird, uh, mostly nocturnal. So if you get to see this species though, it's, uh, they're quite eye-catching um, with this drooping red bill and their cinnamon tones on the side and the back mixed with the black streaking on the back on sides. Um, but like I said, just very secretive. Uh, it's, I've spent a fair bit of time capturing the various species of rails and this is uh, the hardest one to see. It's also the hardest one to capture. Um, we're gonna listen to a couple of its calls. The first one is the ticket or the kadik call. Uh, this is just an advertisement uh, to let other birds to be around 
And then afterwards, we're going to listen to the direct call, which is a pair bond maintenance and territoriality call. So. So that's the ticket or the kiddick call and then the grunting. Okay, so next here we have the yellow rail. So this is the smallest rail um, that less nests in Canada. Actually, there's a black rail that's even smaller than this guy, but they're just south of us down in the States. Uh, this is a, a very secretive bird, um, nocturn, nocturnal. It's mostly active at night, just like most rails. Likes shallow wetlands with grasses and sedges, spike rush meadows. Uh, if you do get to see this bird, again, they're similar to Virginia rails in that they're just really infrequently spotted. Um, but it has a short, stout yellow bill and a short tail. Uh, it's a yellow brown and heavily streaked with a, a bit of a dark kind of mask on its face not quite as much of a mask as the sora but but you can see there it's got a bit of a mask has some white secondaries if you see this guy in flight that's that's a pretty diagnostic when you get to something bursting out of emergent vegetation uh, that you're walking through and it has those white secondaries you're likely looking at a yellow rail uh, again, secretive, nocturnal, rarely seen. And this bird has a rhythmic ticking call that can go on and on for several minutes uh, during a calling bout or just a few seconds. It's variable, but I've heard individual birds call for many minutes without stopping. So that tick, 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 rhythmic ticking is the yellow rail. All right, now on to shorebirds. So there are several types of shorebirds that breed in Prairie Canada. Some are small, some are medium sized, and some are large birds. Often they're seen near or uh, near the water's edge or along shorelines, but not always. Some of these birds, while they use wetlands to meet their daily needs, they actually nest in the upland grass. This is a group of birds that you really want to pay attention to the bill shape and structure along with body proportions and sometimes feeding behaviors because all of these can be helpful in helping to identify these guys down to the species. The kill deer, Charadrius vociferus. This one's most aptly named because it's probably the, one of the more vocal shorebird species that you'll come across. This is a small shorebird that's in the plover family. Uh, it's got a short, straight bill, uh, long tail, pigeon-like head, and um, solid brown on its back. But this double breast band is, is diagnostic. You see a bird with that double breast band running around near gravel roads, and it's probably telling you its name, saying, kill deer, kill deer. Uh, really common in open habitats. This bird has a run and stop. Uh, feeding style uses a lot of visual cues in its foraging. And it also does an elaborate distraction display that you've likely seen um, them do if you've spent any time walking through parking lots in, in you know, the summertime. So this is what this bird here in the lower left corner is just doing. And it's showing that big cinnamon patch on its, on its rump there, but they'll fake a broken wing trying to lead you away from a nest or from its young. So that distraction display is quite common uh, with the killdeer and also with other plovers. Speaking of other plovers, Piping plover is a small shorebird, and it's probably the rarest of prairie breeding shorebirds being one of our endangered species. It has a, an orange bill with a black tip and these bright orange legs. It's a gray on its back, uh, lighter in color than the killdeer was, but, but similar in that pattern on that, that darker on its back, lighter underneath. And this bird has just a single narrow collar on its around its um, neck there. Like 
like other plovers and like a kilder, it does this run, stop, pluck, feeding style, uh, often using its visual cues for, for selecting its prey and then running up and, and having its bites to eat. This bird um, will often be seen near the shores of large lakes and reservoirs and also near the shallow alkali wetlands, which are when they're not uh, full of water during wet years, when they've drawn down in the drier years, they're often some of the breeding sites in the province for this bird. All right, so next we have the American Avocet. This is a, a large, uh, really visible shore bird. It's often spotted in shallow wetlands um, in either pairs or, or groups of birds. So it has a very long, thin, upturned bill and a, and a long neck. The upturned bill, that long, thin, upturned bill is actually more upturned in the female. So if you have a pair of birds uh, that you're seeing together in the breeding season and one of them's bill is relatively straighter than the other one, uh, the one with the straighter bill will be the male and the one with the more curved bill, bill will be the female. So it's got this long neck that's got a rusty wash on it and this bold black and white on the back and long bluish legs. So, uh, these guys uh, walk steadily um, in the shallows, swishing its bill back and forth from side to side and that's how it does its foraging. All right, the willet. So this is another large shorebird. And this guy, if you've ever ventured into the grass near where a willet might have a nest nearby, there's no doubt it's come and told you about it. It has this toe will willet call and they don't stop until you are long, long far away out of the area that they happen to care about. <laughs> so um, this, this guy is pretty drab and, and just model gray overall. Uh, nothing really striking about its plumage. I certainly get noticed with their voice. Uh, they have a long, thick bill that's, you know, pretty much black, uh, long, dull legs. Uh, but they have this bold pattern on their wings when they're in flight, this, this uh, black, white, black pattern. And that's helpful when, when they get up and fly around. If you, if you don't uh, know them by their so will will it call? Uh, you can certainly um, see this big white uh, patch on their wings that helps helps you identify them when they're flying around. Okay, so next is the marbled godwit. This is another large shorebird and another loud shorebird, uh, and another one that, that will say its name when it's alarmed, basically flying around saying godwit, godwit, godwit. So. This bird has a very long upturned bill that is bicolor, so it's pink at the base and uh, black at the tip. It has a bulky body and a small head relative to you know, the rest of the bird. And it has long, dark legs. So marble godwits are marbled brown with cinnamon overall. And the this patch on, on, on their wings, this cinnamon patch on the wings is quite helpful when you see these guys flying around. They uh, do a lot of walking around, uh, steadily probing in the mud for food. Uh, but this bird, when it's nesting here, is actually an upland nester and it lays its eggs in a nest that's in the grass. So real quickly, just to compare the marble godwit and the willet. So the willet's bill is only about one and a half times as long as the length of the head. And it's just this single black bill, you know, single color that's black. And it's um, a bit thicker and heavier relative to the marble godwit, which has a bill that's about three times the length of its head. And it's bicolor, it's a pink base tip. And when these guys are in flight, remember that the willet has this nice white wing patch, whereas the godwit has um, basically a cinnamon part on its, on its wing. 
represent them in color. And that's my name. All right, the long-billed curlew. So this is another large shorebird. It's got a really long and decurved bill. Um, this bird is mottled brown and cinnamon overall. Its under wings are clean and, and cinnamon um, with a cinnamon patch here up on its upper wing. So these are birds that you on the prairies don't necessarily see near wetlands often. You'll actually see them more walking around in the upland habitats where, where they nest. And this long bill is actually um, for probing for food, but more so on the wintering grounds where they spend their time in, in wet pastures and, and forage for invertebrates that are beneath the surface. Here uh, in the prairies, they spend most of their time gleaning insects off of vegetation and uh, pecking at uh, insects that are on the surface of the ground. So uh, even though they have this long bill, you won't see them plunge it into the substrate too often here in the prairies. Okay, spotted sandpiper. So these guys are small shorebirds, uh, pretty much always spotted on a shoreline of a lake or a stream or a pond or a wetland. Um, relative to shorebirds, they've got short legs, um, short rounded wings. A lot of shorebirds have really pointed wings because they're long distance migrants. But this guy has short rounded wings. They're really maneuverable flyers. Uh, their bill uh, for as shorebirds go are a pretty medium length bill. So they're brown on the back with this light belly with spots and it's giving its name the spotted sandpiper. They have a, a dark eye line that kind of cuts through uh, a white eye ring. Um, but this bird gets noticed for its constant movement. It's always quickly walking or if it's standing still, it's bobbing, it's, it's, uh, it's either bobbing or dipping its back a bit. And if they're not doing that, they're usually flying uh, along with a rapid whistle-like call in this like real fluttery wing beat. So spotted sandpipers actually try to get you to notice them. And this is another species that if you've spent any time near the aquatic habitats in the province, you've likely already encountered the species and, and just didn't know it if you, if you don't already know the species. All right, so next we've got the upland sandpiper. This is a medium-sized shorebird. This bird is more often heard from upland habitats and sometimes seen, you know, spotted perching on fence posts or, or sometimes on wires. Uh, it's buffy brown. It's modeled pattern kind of overall. There's really nothing striking about the plumage of this bird other than it's really got great camouflage for nesting in the upland in the nest or in the grass. It's got a round head with a large round eye and pretty long neck with a short, short bill and long yellow legs and a long tail for as shorebird tails go. If you were to look at some of the other shorebirds, um, this guy's got you know, more like kind of chicken-like tail than, than what's typical of shorebirds. Um, if you've ever heard a wolf whistle-like call coming from the upland, it's probably an upland sandpiper. This bird's got a kind of comical sounding song. And uh, I'll just encourage you to look that one up on your own and listen to them. All right, so the Wilson snipe. This is a medium sized bird that is commonly heard here in the prairies. The male does this winnowing flight display where when they're in their descent, uh, uh, the wind, the way that the, the wind comes over their tail feathers here, these retrices, uh, causes it to make this winnowing call. And that is likely something that if you live here on the prairies, you have probably heard during the springtime. So these birds have a really long bill, a chunky body with a short tail and almost no neck. Um, it's another, you know, mottled brown buffy bird. Um, but this one with a um, some white stripes on its back here. And then, you know,
know, it has this little bit of an eye stripe going through its eye. So this is a bird that is really common in wet areas, uh, especially meadows. Um, it'll be out in pastures if we are in, um, you know, wet years where we've got standing water out, out in, you know, causing ephemeral wetlands out in pastures, they'll, they'll be out in those types of habitats. So pretty common, um, but again, you'll likely hear this guy first before you notice them. Unless you're walking around wetlands and you happen to flush them out where they will be foraging along the edge. Okay, last bird on today's list or on this list is the Wilson's fallow rope. So fallow ropes are pretty small birds. They have these really long, thin, needle-like bills. Slender overall, really long neck, long legs. Overall, just gives the bird a real um, delicate appearance. So the female has this bold black eye stripe behind the eye and down the neck and the cinnamon and rusty uh, highlights on its neck. And the male coloration is more subdued. So this is a male down here that we're looking at. And so this is a polyandrous species where the male actually incubates the eggs. And so it's, and this is one of those rare cases in birds where the females are actually the more uh, colorful of the sexually di um, uh, dichromatic uh, species. So these birds are more often spotted foraging on prairie and parkland wetlands. You'll often see them floating on the water, um, doing little spins. And when they're, they're doing their little circles in the water, they're, they're basically creating an upwelling so that they can forage on critters that are in the, in the wetlands. That wraps up this list of birds. I wanna thank you for watching the video. At Birds Canada, we're always happy to help you learn about birds and how to identify them. We also have citizen science programs for all skill levels. So check out our website at birdscanada.org or follow us on social media. And if you have any questions or comments about this video, you can contact us at the email address on the screen there.